I've got a couple announcement-ish things to do before I get into the message. First, every once in a while, I will ho- uh, host a connection group in my office. Um, what do we call it? I call it like Bible on steroids. And it, so the concept is really, really digging in and learning how to, how to not study the Bible as much as read it and let it impact your life in the maximum possible way. And it's not for the faint of heart. Um, there is homework that is expected to be done. And I hold people to a pretty high level in the class, but they, I think they get a lot out of it. I enjoy it. My inner professor gets a chance to kind of pop out for a moment. And if you're interested in that, I only take 12 people per time, and you can't take it twice. So if you send me an email, um, steve at spousestrings.org, or just sign up to the normal connection group things. I'll get you hooked up with that and the, the book you got to buy and all the fun stuff that goes with it. So that's coming up starting October 12th. And then this one kind of bounces off of what we talked about last week. We were talking about, um, I don't know, I had this little session where I started talking about how our place was a, was a, a community where you listened and learned and you didn't yell at each other and we, we kind of grow, and especially if social issues and things like that. And so this idea popped, and I think it was my idea. It was one of the staff's ideas. Some of us came up with that concept. We've been working through it. We don't have a name for it yet. We don't know what we're going to call it. But on October 23rd, if that's a Sunday, that's Sunday, right? October 23rd. Um, th- we're going to do something here Sunday night at 6 and I'm going to get a group of people together uh, who are very diverse and we're inviting everybody in and we're going to listen to the stories. I'm going to sort of just interview them and let them tell their stories. It's not a chance for people to come up and try to make points or tell everybody why they're wrong and they're right. No arguing, no, just listening to people tell their stories so that we can have the understanding that's necessary for the kind of dialogue that's re- required to actually fi- fix problems instead of just pointing fingers at each other and yelling. Anybody else kind of tired of pointing fingers and yelling being our strategy for dealing with problems? And so if we're going to be the solution, we have to do stuff like that. So um, it is October 23rd, right? That is a w- Sunday? Okay, make sure I get that right. I'm really bad with dates. So it'll be 6 o'clock. Um, if you'd like to be on the panel, if you come from a diverse background, send me a message, uh, steve at spousestrings.org, and I'll be picking, like I said, about seven people to be on that, on that panel to discuss things. We may break into groups afterwards for discussion. We have got the details. Don't have a name for it yet. <laughs> I'm not sure what you call that. And, but, we, but just know it's coming and make a note in your calendars. And I, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's something that can actually will make the community available to the community. I think it's something that can actually be a help. And us actually doing something that actually works to change our community and maybe even a little bit of our piece of the world. So anyway, we c- just finished a series where we talked about how messed up the world was and our response in the world. There's a piece that's missing, and we're going to do that piece on this next series because while we are in the world and while we sometimes get frustrated by the world the reality is that we have a perspective that is beyond just here and now right right that we if we're going to go from a god perspective we think see things a little differently and so we're going to do a series called foundations where we look at the the things we need to start weighing and thinking so that we're not caught in the chaos but we're living above the chaos so that we have a different perspective, so that we're, we have peace in the storm, as it were, in the middle of all that's going around us. And if you want to, we're going to be in, in Psalm number 11. And if you want to t- turn there, turn in your Bible, turn on your Bible, to, to Psalm 11. And let me just give you a touch of background. Well, we don't know the exact background, but we can guess. Because David was the king, and he's writing this psalm. And David had a, occasionally had a really bad month. You know how sometimes you have a bad day? David would occasionally have a really bad month or even year. And in one of those really bad months, his son Absalom decided to overthrow him as king. Tried to formulate a coup. Now, that's what makes every dad proud, is when your son decides to overthrow your government. Okay? And Absalom was a very, very smart man, a very good politician, a good soldier. So when he threw the, when he started the coup, he caught David off guard. You know, if you're going to have a good coup, you've got to make sure the other guys aren't ready for it. So he does. And there's a point where David's life is in trouble. And this is probably the background to this psalm. And let me just read it. And you may, as I'm reading it, go, that doesn't sound that different than some of the things that go on in my life. Um, Psalm 11, starting verse 1 says, I trust the Lord for protection. So why do you say to me, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety? 
The wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows into the bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those who, whose hearts are right. The foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? And you may, you may have heard that quote. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And we play it out there as being this, oh my gosh, hopeless. You ever hear that about America? Oh my goodness, the foundations are being destroyed. What can we do? And we, we have this tendency to look at the world and go, Things are so screwed up, there's nothing. And you, you develop this hopelessness. Everybody ever, anybody ever struggle with that about, about our culture in general? You're just looking at it and you, you pull up, you know, you turn on CNN or you, you pop up USA Today on your computer or actually, what are these things called? Newspapers, you open one of those. And you're just overwhelmed and you feel like the foundations are being destroyed. They're doing their best to drive God out of everything and you start feeling hopeless. And then you have the other reaction where instead of opening up the newspaper, you open up the email you get every morning with your checking account balance. And you go, the foundations have been destroyed. Or other, th- you know, your life's going crazy. You have that, that, those phases of life where, the, where everything just goes completely caca and you're just, oh, goodness gracious, and you're feeling helpless and hopeless, and you're, you're kind of like David, where somebody's come to you and say, you know what you should do? Run away. Run far, run fast, and run. Just get the heck out of Dodge. And that's what you want to do. You want to say, okay, I, the, the foundations are being destroyed in my life, in our culture, wherever it is, or both, and I want to just run away. N- nobody here can relate to that, right? But what David says next, see, a lot of times we, they, we hear that, the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? You think it's, a ho- it's not a hopeless psalm because that's the people talking to David. David's got an answer for them. And he starts in verse 4. But the Lord is in his holy temple the Lord still rules from heaven he watches everyone closely examining every person on earth the Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked he hates those who love violence he will rain down blazing coals and burning sulfur on the wicked punishing them with scorching wind for the righteous Lord loves justice the virtuous will see his face and the point that he starts out making and this is one you this is so you know this but you forget this You got those points in your life where you know this is true, but you forget it, or you know it here, and you forget it here. And the first point, the most important point, God is completely in control. He's not a little bit in control. He's not sort of in control. He's not having an impact. He is totally in control. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord still rules from heaven. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 2. I'm glad they put it at the very beginning of the book of Psalms because I just love Psalm 2. I can go back and read that one over and over and over. And that first part of it, it says, The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. And we feel, you ever feel like that? Like the people, there are people actually trying to drive God out of our culture. There are people trying to drive God out of your life. There are people who ridicule you for your faith. There are people who say, we shouldn't be doing Christian stuff anywhere in the world. And they're, you know, magazines, ah, terrible thing about that faith. And they're trying to drive it out. And we get freaked out, right? What are we going to do? They're attacking the faith. They're attacking Christianity. We should freak out. We should form a committee. We should protest. You know what God does? I love this verse. Psalm 2, verse 4. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. You ever had a three-year-old really ticked off at you? It's usually a little boy, and he decides he's going to take you down. This little boy, he is furious, and he is going to take you down. And he lets you know, I am coming for you. And he comes at you. And what, you're doing this thing here, right? The, the stiff arm. And you got your hand right in, the, right, in the, right, in the, right in his forehead, your palm on his forehead. And you're holding him here, right? And he's coming at you and he's calling you names and he is going to get to you. And you're holding him here. Now, what else, what else are you doing while you're holding him? You're laughing. Because this little three-year-old thinks he's going to take you down and you know there is no way on earth unless his daddy shows up and his daddy's a big man that nothing's going to go wrong from your perspective. And that's how God views all these problems. All this stuff that's happening, 
all this stuff that's happening in the world where the world's just falling apart. It's all going to hell. And God's going, huh? is that your best shot? You're going to take me out with that? I love it because it, it says in there, I don't know if you, you noticed it. It said in verse 2, the wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows in the bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those whose hearts are right. But in verse 6, if you move on down to verse 6, it says this about God. God will rain down blazing coals and burning sulfur on the wicked. Okay, they got bows and arrows. God's got fire and brimstone. It's kind of like, I got this arrow and I'm taking you down. You're going, yeah, I got God's Uzi. <laughs> Do you want to play? <laughs> and that's the perspective that the Bible always has. God is not intimidated. The culture can do whatever the culture wants to do. The culture can go absolutely crazy. And God is sitting in heaven snickering at their stupid ideas of how they're going to take God out. And when we look at that and we look up and, you know, you may be like me. You've woken up a morning recently and you're going to your, going to your spouse. Honey, I had the weirdest dream and you would not believe who's running for president. And then your spouse says, that is not a dream, that is reality. And you're like, I'm going back to sleep now. And you think, this is just such a weird, chaotic, out of control, nothing we can do about it. It is hopeless world. And we need to stand back and say, well, if God's snickering, I can relax. If the best they can shoot at us makes God laugh, then my need to be high stress about this is gone. I don't need to self-medicate my way out of this election. I don't need to worry about all the stuff that's going on because God's still on his throne. God still has the world by the front of the forehead. And he, any, anytime you read that, somebody say, oh, they're going to eliminate Christianity in our lifetime. Just picture God with his hand on the three-year-old's forehead laughing at him. Okay, because that's the reality. But here's, here's the cool part. See, God's completely in control of the universe. God's also completely in control. Are you ready? God is also completely in control of your life. See, that's the part. You, you'll, either, you'll, you'll go, okay, he's got the universe. But he's got your life completely in control. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. But even the hairs on your head have all been counted. So don't be afraid, therefore. You are worth more than many sparrows. It's interesting that when he started out the whole, this whole psalm, David's, the first word that he has there is, I trust in the Lord. So why do you say to me? Now, if you look in the Bible, a lot of times, most of the time, the Bible talks in plural. If you look in Paul's letters, he's always saying, we. He's always talking about we. David, in this instance, says, I. He's, he doesn't say, Israel doesn't have to worry. He says, David doesn't have to worry. He didn't say, Israel is trusting in God. He said, David is trusting in God. See, God is totally in control of your circumstances. Which brings us to the second thing that pops out as we look at this psalm, and that is that not only is in God to completely in control, he's also totally aware. It says he watches everyone closely, examining every, every person on earth. The nice thing about having a God who's all-powerful and universally everything is that he can watch the universe and he can watch you. See, we have a tendency. We either see forest or we see trees. God can always see the whole universe and God can always see you. Let me just read you a few verses to remind you of that truth. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, observing the wicked and the good. Psalm 33, 18. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. And actually, just before that, Verses 13 to 15. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on the earth. He who forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. Everything that happens in your life, everything you think, everything you do, everything anybody does to you, everything that happens to you, God is totally and completely aware of. He never forgets you for a second. Now, Here's where you come up with the, the first real objection. Steve, okay, I'm buying God's got the universe, and I kind of get he's fully aware of all that's going on in my life, but seriously, sometimes it doesn't feel like it. 
Do you ever notice sometimes when you're going through the worst times, you would think when you're going through the worst times, God would be closest to you. As a matter of fact, that's what the super spiritual people tell you, right? You've met the super spiritual people who just make you feel bad about yourself. You know, their, their purpose in life needs to be to make you feel bad. Oh, God is so close to me. I'm going through a trial and God has never been more real. And you're going, aren't you just the luckiest thing in the world? Because <laughs> it seems like there are times God's close to me in, in the trials, but there are an awful lot of times when I'm going through it. I am, I am up to here with it. I am buried in it, and it feels like God is nowhere to be seen. Anybody get that? Am I the only one that feels that way sometimes? Yeah. Well, let me, let me, let's, let's go look at this a little more closely. It, it says that God watches everyone closely, examining every person on earth. And that word examine, it's the word that's used if you're taking gold ore or silver ore and turning the silver ore into silver how do you do that well if you want to turn silver ore into silver you take a feather and a pillow and you lay the silver ore on the pillow and you tickle it with the feather not hard just gently brush against the silver ore while it lays on the pillow and it transforms into pure that doesn't work at all does it How do you turn silver ore into silver? You take the silver ore and you put it on, in in those days, they didn't have big factories for it, you would take a long, long thing because you don't want to be near the fire yourself and you put the silver ore on this spoon thing and you stick it into the hottest fire you can find. Knowing that the silver will survive the fire but nothing else in the silver will. And so you stick it in there and the silver starts to to melt and boil and all the impurities start to burn away. And then you pull it out and you check. And that's the word examine. Now there's a verse sometimes when you're going through a hard time that somebody's going to quote to you. And they're only going to quote one verse and they need to quote two. Because the verse they're going to quote to you and they're going to be all spiritual when they quote it to you. And they're going to be thinking they're making you feel better and they're just making you feel more like crap. Is verse Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And when they say that to you, you're saying, All things to the good. I know this is blasphemous. It doesn't feel good. Got to read the next verse. Romans 8, 28, We know that on all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. See, when God wants the good for you, the good's not a new car, okay? The good is he wants you to look just like Jesus. He's wanting to conform you to be just like Christ. That's God's goal for your life. That's the ultimate good in your life. That new car, it's going to rot and decay and crash and get scratched and all that junk's going to happen. And you're going to get rid of it because you got tired of that car because it's got a dent in it. And you're going to want a different new car and you're going to want a different new that and a different new that and a different new that. So God, when he says, I'm going to give you good stuff, is not going to give you stuff that rots. He's not going to give you a bag of really cool smoke. He's going to give you permanent stuff, and the most permanent, wonderful thing he can do for you is to transform you into the image of Jesus Christ. And so God puts you on the spoon, and he puts you in the fire, and he pulls you back, and he examines you. And you may have heard this. Do you know how the silversmith knows the silver is ready? Because every impurity messes up the reflection. So you put it in there, and you pull it back, and you look at your reflection. Oh, there's a, there's a smudge. I need to put it back in. And, there's a, and, there's, and you know how he knows when it's done? When he looks into it, and all he sees is his own reflection. And when Jesus Christ looks at your life, and all he sees is his own reflection, he's done. And, he's, and until then, the good thing he can do for you is put you back in the fire. See, now, we have this really screwed up idea. We have this idea that we buy into and we keep using it. I do it myself. This idea that the normal of life is the smooth and the odd is the messed up. That it's smooth, smooth, smooth. Disruption, smooth. Anybody's life look anything like that? Or are you like me? When things go good for too long, you start getting nervous. And you're like afraid to mention it to somebody. Like you're in your connection group. How's everything going? And you're going, 
well, I want to say it's been going really good for about six months now, but if I say it out loud, God might hear it <laughs> and go, oh, I'm sorry, I had you on a timer for a pause. I'm sorry, I've got to get back to you now. <laughs> no. The smooth is just a break to get you ready for the next bumpy. He pulls you out and he looks and he puts you right back in because you're not done yet. And he's not going to quit until you're done. Now he's totally in control of it. I like to say if, if it got to you, God let it through. And God's in control of all these circumstances, but he's using all these circumstances to transform you to be like Jesus. A.W. Tozer says, whom God will use greatly, he will learn, first wound deeply. But then you say, but Steve, okay, I get it. I get, that I'm, I, I get that he's transforming me. I get the trials are the way he does it. I understand all that. But why is it that when I'm in the worst ones, I don't hear him? Why is it that when I'm in the worst one, all those spiritual people are saying, yeah, I've never been closer to God than I am right now in the middle of this trial. And you're going, man, in the middle of my trial, I can't see God from here. I can't hear his voice. I don't feel his presence. Why is God not speaking loudly in the middle of this? Well, God is your teacher. And trials are your test. And every teacher is quiet during the test. So when you're going through the trial and things are going really, really bad and you're saying, God, where are you? He, he's, he's watching. But he can't give you the answers. He's got to let you learn. He's got to let you grow. And during the test, he's quiet. Doesn't mean he doesn't love you means he loves you way too much to leave you like you're going and like you're becoming. Okay? Because I, I heard this story once. I don't know if it's true. But it's a cool story. So if you're a pastor, you can tell stories and, and just you, it's a parable if it's not true. About this kid and he, he he's, he's goes into his, gar his garage and he, he sees a, a, butter, a, a, a caterpillar is making a cocoon in the corner of the roof or the ceiling I mean and he's and he's a, he's, a, he's an inquisitive kid so he he thinks this is the greatest thing in the world so he watches it make the cocoon and then he comes back and checks like every day on, on the cocoon he goes back and checks regularly on the cocoon and then one day he sees it the cocoon's vibrating <laughs> this is cool we're gonna get a butterfly and he comes back the next day and it's and it's still and he sees a little crack he's got all the butter so he parks himself says I'm gonna watch this butterfly come out and he waits, and the cocoon vibrates, and the cocoon vibrates, and the cocoon vibrates. And he can see a little bit. He sees a leg coming out of the, of the crack in the, in the cocoon. And, he th and, he, and he's going, oh, my goodness. It take, it's taking forever. The butterfly's in trouble. I should help. And he goes and gets a knife, and, and, and he takes the cocoon down off, off the ceiling. And, and he very, very, very carefully, he slits open the cocoon. And out comes the butterfly. And it falls straight to the ground and dies. Because only as it beats its way out of the cocoon does the butterfly develop enough strength in its wings to be able to fly. Only as it fights its way out does it develop the strength to live. And you, my friendly butterfly... God has amazing things he wants to do in your life. God has amazing plans for you. But the only way you can get there is to get out of your own cocoon sometimes. The only way you can get there is to fight and to struggle and to go against the odds and again to the challenges and look them in the teeth and go straight through the hard times. Because that's when you get the strength to fly. Because make no mistake about it, those trials are the best thing God can say to you ever. When I was in high school, I had a couple teachers, and they, they approached me differently. They're both very, very good teachers. And one of them taught history and civics and that kind of stuff. And it, this is back, uh, you younger people under the, I don't know what age you got to be to remember this. Th back in the olden days, back, back when they invented fire, they had these things called report cards. Now, they call them report cards now, but they're not even cards. They're just sheets of paper that came off a printer. And you get one, what, every three weeks? For every class. No, when I was in high school, they gave you a report card. 
okay, and you got a report card, and on the report card day, every nine weeks, the first teacher would give you your report card with your grade on it in that class, and you would go to each class, and in each class you would walk to the front and give your report card to the teacher, and they would take these things they called ink pens, and they would write your grade for the nine weeks on there or the semester, depending on when it was. And I remember, I'll never forget this, I went up to, this, to the history teacher and I handed him my report card and I was a pretty good student. And he took my report card and he wrote my grade on there and he looked at me as I'm turning around and he said, I can't challenge you, can I? Oh, I just walked back. <laughs> Whatever. Small school, not a lot of students. My chemistry teacher had a different strategy. She understood me a little better than he did in some ways. And she had some sort of a mystic arcane grading strategy. You ever have that teacher who had the mystic, you had no idea what you're going to get. Because this, this person, they might have been counting how many beats per minute your heart beat while you're in the classroom. There is no way to know what this person's counting. They're just giving you grades and they're coming from somewhere. Every nine weeks, well, not every, almost every nine weeks in chemistry and physics, she would give me an A minus. Now, I'm not bragging, but I was not an A-minus student, okay? I didn't make A-minuses. My dad used to joke, my, my dad's favorite way of complimenting me, because my dad's kind of the backhand compliment, he'd take my report card every year, and he'd look at it and go, no improvement. Because <laughs> there was just that one letter all over the whole thing, right? That's just how it was. She'd give me an A-minus because she knew that I would double up my effort the next nine weeks to make sure that when we got to the end of the semester, I had gotten the A that I wanted to get what I wanted because I'm kind of that guy. And she knew that what she could do to make me do that was to give me an A- minus, because she knew that I was capable of more than I was giving her. You do realize when God puts you through the trials, what he's saying is, in you, I see potential. In you, I see the opportunity for me to accomplish amazing things in your life and through your life. And the only way I can do that is to take you to another level. And I cannot take you to another level if I just pass you on. If I just give you the nice, easy ride in life, you'll never become all that I want you to be. So when you're in the trials and you're in the troubles and everything's going wrong, you're not going, God, you must hate me. No, God loves you and he thinks amazing things of you. He looks at you and he sees intense potential. But the only way he can get the potential out is to let you fight your way out of the cocoon. To let you go through the struggles and through the trials to become the person he wants you to be. Does that make sense? And then you look around. Okay, God's in control. Got it? Completely in control. He's totally aware of everything that's going on in the world and in my life. And then you ask the next question. Okay, God, why are the idiots doing so well? Shouldn't you be, you mentioned fire and brimstone. Shouldn't that be more common? I would think that would be like a regular occurrence. I should be walking down the street and just boom, see somebody. You just I saw three on the way home get roasted. That's cool. <laughs> Watching TV live, 17 people, bam. The entire cast of the show just went around. One of those reality TV shows, the whole cast gone. <laughs> but he, he wants to remind you. Now, while he may not be sending fire and brimstone now, he's in control, he's fully aware, and he's keeping score. Okay? The Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked. This is verses 5 through 7 of that psalm. The Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked. He hates those who love violence. He will rain down blazing coals and burning sulfur on the wicked, punishing them with scorching winds. For the righteous Lord loves justice. The virtuous will see his face. Now, at this point, you got two different responses. There's the first the, is the hooray response. It's possible, though, there's another response or two hiding in there. Because there could be the response where he says, that verse 7, the righteous Lord loves justice, the virtuous will see his face. And it says, we'll see his face, and I automatically think of the Beatitudes, where Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And now I have an option. 
It says pure in heart. I can lie or I can see a problem because I've looked at my heart. Mm, anybody, right? Because we, we can pretend really good. We're really good at acting like we got it together. But I'm not going to let you look in my heart because it's an ugly, ugly place. Okay? That, that's probably not you. That's just me. And I'm thinking, if God showing his face to me and God loving me is dependent on me having a pure heart, I'm in serious, serious, deep doo-doo. Well, that's the good news. Because the Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In the midst of all the depravity and the scum and the icky that I am deep down inside, all the, all the depravity that flows out of me, God died, Christ died for me then. There's nothing I can do to clean up my own heart. Ask anybody who's tried. There just aren't enough leaves to turn over. And so instead of me earning my way to the pure in heart, God says, how about I just give you a heart transplant? Or to put it another way, I don't know, I might be the only person in the room with this, but I'm going to go on the assumption there's at least two or three of you who have the credit card. Like you've got, you know, you've got a couple, you've got two or three, but there's the, we could call it the mistakes credit card. The one where you took, you went to Best Buy and you should have been window shopping. But you brought home something they had to help you carry to the truck. <laughs> or you went to Cabela's and you should have bought a pack of gum on the way out. And instead you had to find room in the back for all the stuff you took home. Or whatever your favorite place to go and spend way more money than you should. Or to trade in that car you shouldn't trade in yet. Or all those things that you do. And you've got this credit card that is the sum total of all the mistakes you've made financially in your life. You've got one or two over here you can use to actually just go out to dinner and whatever. You've got a check card, all that. But you've got the one over here which is the sum total of all my financial mistakes so far. Okay, and that, that thing just it comes in once a month and, and, and you, you know, religiously pay the minimum and shop around and find a place to put the, the lowest interest rate possible and you just know that one of these days something's going to happen and you're going to, yeah, pay that off somehow. And you just lug that credit card around with you. And imagine if one day you, you get your e-statement or actually one of those in the mail or however you find out and you look at it, and it said balance due zero. And you go, honey, did we transfer the balance again? No. Did we sell one of the kids? Okay, maybe two. No. And you, you look down the list, and at the very bottom, it says, paid in full, Jesus Christ. Because what you have is a spiritual credit card of all the mistakes and all the sins and all the junk you've done in your entire life. And every time you do, one more charge goes on that credit card. And the real bad news is, you have this credit card through the, the first back of Satan. And you should see his interest rate. And you have absolutely no chance on earth of ever paying that thing off. And God looks down from heaven and says, this is a hopeless situation. Do I have anybody here in heaven who's good at hopeless? And the Son of God, Jesus Christ, raises his hand and said, I specialize in hopeless. And God sends his son Jesus, and Jesus lives a perfectly sinless life, and then he goes to the cross and he takes your credit card with him. He takes everything you've ever done wrong, every sin you've committed, every mistake you've made, everything that you're ashamed of, and he takes it to the cross with him, and he pays in full your debt to God, and in exchange, you get credited with having a pure heart. And even though God is still in the process of actually transforming that heart to be a heart like Christ, in his record book, he's already marked off the entire debt. So when you see it talking about having a pure heart to see God, that doesn't mean you've got to suddenly become perfect because you ain't going to do it. But because of what Jesus has done for you, you have that relationship with God. 
And that's the first way we talk about judgment that we're looking at. We're looking at the fact that God is keeping score and you have a choice. What are you going to do with all that sin debt you've accumulated throughout your life? Are you going to let Jesus pay it? Or are you going to try to chip away at it yourself? Okay, and that's the first of, when he talks about the God's keeping score, that's for us, that's the first score. Now the second score is something like you'd find in, um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now that one, he says we, Paul's talking to the church, he's talking about us. We're going to appear before Christ, and we're going to be judged based on what we've done and not done. See, here's the deal. When you become a Christian, when you decide to follow Christ, when you accept Jesus Christ, when you get saved, whatever phrase you're used to and comfortable with, when that happens in your life, the Bible teaches very clearly that in God's perspective, what he does is he adopts you into the family. You become a member of the family. Now, some of you grew up in a family that owned a business. And the expectation was that you would, when you grew up, what? Come into the family business, start working the family business. Some of you grew up in a military family, and there was an, like this expectation, when I grow up, I'm going to join the military too, because that's what we do in our family, that's our family business. Well, here's the deal with God. When God adopts you into his family, he expects you to join the family business. And his family business is advancing the kingdom of God taking his love and his justice and his mercy throughout the world, serving him, loving him, doing all the things we call service. That's what he expects you to do because you're part of the family and you're expected to be part of the family business. And what he says here is when you stand before Christ, you don't have the option if you've ever accepted a Christ of going to heaven or hell. That's been settled. That was settled by Jesus Christ on the cross and that's, that's done. But he is going to look at you and go, how'd you handle the family business? What did you do with the family business? Because while God is totally in control of this screwed up universe, he put you here to help. He put you here to make things better. He put you here to be salt and light, to be the city on the hill, to be all those things we talk about. That's why you're here. Because you have the relationship with him and now you're part of the family business. And so, nice path we've taken. We start out and we talk about how we're in this crazy, crazy world and we got this really powerful God and he's totally in control of this world and he's totally in control of my life. And he's totally aware of everything going on in my life. And he is keeping score. So now we have to ask ourselves some questions because I don't do this for fun. I do this so that you can make decisions to move closer to God. And so the first question, of course, is this. Do you have that relationship with Christ? Can can you imagine if you woke up tomorrow and you have the credit card over here? And instead of waking up and finding out the credit card has been paid, you wake up and find out there's enough money in your checking account to pay it off. And you go, huh, that's cool having a lot of money in my checking account. I think I'll leave it there. And you just leave it there. You don't pay off any of your bills. You don't buy anything. You just leave that money in your checking account. Don't even put it in a savings account to draw interest. You just leave it there. Your credit card balance just keeps going up. Your finances just keep going down. It's over there and you're not going to use it. You can know all about having that relationship with Christ, but you've never, if you've never done anything about it, if you never ask Christ to forgive you, it's just like having the money in your checking account and not paying off any of the bills. So if you're ready to pay off that debt, if you're ready to let God pay off that debt for you, what we have you do is just grab one of these blue bags. We have some there and there and back on the two bookshelves. If you grab a blue bag, we've got people in the church who've been trained in this. They know what they're doing. They'll come to you. They'll take about 10 minutes. They'll walk you through the contents of the bag and show you how to have a relationship with Christ, how to get him to pay off your sin debt card. If you've already done that, the next step is to be baptized, to announce, I did it. I'm ready to have a relationship with Christ. I'm ready to live a new life in Christ. I'm ready to be part of the family business. We do that through baptism. We do that the first Wednesday of every month, which means this coming Wednesday. If you'd like to be baptized, let us know. I'm taking it that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, No. 
sorry. <laughs> no, I didn't even notice. Um, <laughs> no. What were we, t- we were talking about, we do finish baptism, right? So what do I talk about after baptism? You know the answer. What's after baptism? The cross. Because during this talk, you may, you may, you may have realized that there's something that you're not trusting God in and you want to pray about it, that's what the cross is for. There's anything in your life, there's, you want to pray about anything at all, you go over to the cross during this next song and you can pray. And if you want to pray with somebody, we've got some people over there who'd be glad to approach one of them and they'll pray with you. We've also got communion stations, one in the front, one in the back. And the purpose of those is to remind yourself of all Christ's done for you. To, to go back and say, okay, this is, this is the body of, of my Savior, this is the blood of my Savior, and this is what God did for me. Remind yourself of that. All right. We're going to do one more song. Have some announcements. And you're going to go back out into the crazy. Okay? Now, when you go, you have some options. You can go back out into the crazy, the crazy in the universe and the crazy in your life. And you can forget what we talked about. You can let that chaos infect you. You can let the panic of the world panic you. You can let the chaos of your situation freak you out. Or you can remember what we talked about. You can remember that God is completely, 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 always and completely in control. That he is totally, totally, totally aware. And he is always keeping score.